Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Management of Shared Mobility Data webinar. My name is Anaf Mushed, and I'll help facilitate today's webinar. This webinar, the second in a series of five, which will present an overview of NCHRP 08119 Data Integration Sharing and Management for Transportation Planning and Traffic Operations. As a quick reminder, at National Operations Center of Excellence, we offer a variety of resources to support the transportation systems management and operations community. You can go to NOCO's website to browse through links for TISM resources and news. Previous webinar recordings and case studies can be accessed from there. Now I'll cover a few logistics for today's webinar. We're recording this webinar and the recording will be available on NOCO's website. All the attendees are encouraged to stay engaged by using the Q&A feature for questions and chat feature for comments. These are both on the bottom of your screen. We have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions, we encourage you to enter them in the Q&A area as they come to your mind at any time. Uh, we'll also have a, have a poll session. So please uh, participate in the poll session as well. Um, now I'll hand it over to Mike, the principal at McGrain Consulting, who will be moderating today's webinar. Mike? Thanks. Um, you can go to the uh, the next slide. So for the, the agenda for today, as, as was mentioned, uh, the two products we're gonna be talking about on shared mobility as part of a much broader NCHRP uh, program looking uh, much more broadly at data integration and transportation planning and traffic operations. So uh, Kelly, who's the overall project manager for the NCHRP project will give uh, an overview uh, on the overall project and the other pieces of it. Then I'll give a, a brief introduction to data management for shared mobility. I'll talk about the two forthcoming uh, reports that are coming out of the NCHRP project in this area, the resource guide and the uh, managing sensitive data guide that's coming out. And then we are very happy and uh, to have uh, three panelists joining us today to talk more about shared mobility data. Uh, Angela Giacchetti, Michael Schwartz, and Sharda Strassmore. They'll each uh, give a short presentation, then we'll have a, a panel discussion uh, on, on that more broadly, as well as your Q&A to, uh, to wrap up for the day. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to Kelly. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Um, I'm just going to give a very quick overview because I, I want to get to the speakers. But as Mike mentioned, uh, NCHRP 08119 was a, a pretty big project. Um, we started it back in 2019. It's wrapping up next month. Uh, multiple phases, starting with um, uh, information gathering and identification of products. And then we created a website, which I'll show you all um, and you can go to. And then um, the development, testing and, and deployment of products. And uh, just, you know, the overall objective of this project was to um, uncover and share effective practices, challenges, lessons learned, emerging practices and opportunities for data sharing, integration and management and then to develop tools, methods, and guidance for improving data sharing, integration, and management practices to enable transportation agencies to make better planning and operations decisions. Next slide. So we created 11 standalone research products. Um, I'm not gonna read through all of these, um, but today, as Mike said, we are focusing on the shared mobility data research guide and managing sensitive shared mobility data. We have another webinar in a couple of weeks that is going to focus on some smart work zone devices uh, for work zone data feeds and by case studies. And then um, the first week in uh, December, we have we're going to focus on a. Uh, little software product that we developed for conflating to uh, network, uh, sources of network data. And then uh, we wrap up the five-part series with uh, a focus on um, freight to date, freight data products. And then our the website, um, which you can find at uh, data.transportationops.org. Next slide. Um, is a centralized searchable web-based resource library. It's, it's all the information that we gathered in phase one of the research. 
and um, documents that knowledge, use cases, challenges, et cetera. Um, you can see across the top that we've got data application areas, a uh, re overview of the research products, and, and then also additional resources. So um, please uh, feel free to visit this site to learn a little bit more about the pro project and the outputs of our phase one. Um, the phase two is the website and the phase three is a um, comprehensive final report, which will compile all of the products into one document and that should be published sometime next year by TRB. And I'll hand it back to Mike, thanks. Okay, thanks. I think, uh, so I'm gonna give a brief intro, but I think first we wanna know a little bit more about our audience. So we have two quick poll questions for you. If you could uh, respond to those, we'd appreciate it. Okay, I think we've had the first poll question. Uh, we go to the second poll question. Okay, if folks can finish up uh, putting their answers in. Great, I think we can close that poll. And then can, can we see the results? All right, so we see here uh, the plurality is uh, data analysts or data users of the data. Um, we don't have anybody that's providing the data from mobility services, and a lot of you just generally are interested in the, in the topic without a current role, which is great. Uh, hopefully you'll learn more about it uh, today. Uh, and then if we could take a look at poll question one answers. Mike, can you see the, see the answers? I saw answers to two. I didn't see answers to one. We'll give it a second. If not, we'll move on. Uh, I'll share the results later, Mike. Yeah, we're good later. Okay, so if we can go to the next slide, please. So just some uh, some level setting with a, a quick overview. Um, we have the SAE uh, definition, I think is a good one of shared mobility. So it's broader than just micro mobility. That's why we use the term shared mobility here. Uh, it includes micro mobility services like uh, scooter share, bicycle shares, but it also includes uh, ride sharing, transportation network companies, as well as traditional uh, taxi companies and, and other modes where folks are sharing travel. Um, and the uh, public agencies need to collect data from the providers of these services that they've licensed to operate in their jurisdictions uh, to, to help uh, plan for these services, to help regulate, to help enforce the rules on these services. Uh, but at the same time, there's some issues and concerns that some of the data uh, may be personally identifiable to the users of these services, and some of the data may be proprietary to the vendors that are providing the service that they wouldn't want shared with their competitors. Um, next slide. And the, the uses for this data uh, have divided up into uh, three broad areas uh, for helping to manage operations, keeping track of how, how the vehicles are being utilized, how much they're being utilized, uh, that it can help with setting caps for how many are allowed in an area, uh, deciding where you're going to prohibit operations or where you're going to allow or not allow parking or providing parking areas like scooter corrals, uh, can involve broader planning and analysis, how to integrate uh, shared mobility to provide last mile services for transit, uh, what physical infrastructure is being used, where isn't there enough physical infrastructure, uh, it, some areas and jurisdictions for some applications may charge for curb space, help you decide on, on that and what the charge, as well as enforcement activities as what to make sure that the uh, providers are following all the, the rules and regulations that have been set uh, for their operations or all the different uses that can be made uh, by the public sector of this data. Next slide. So there's two uh, products that came out of this NCHRP product project, sorry. The first one is a resource guide, the Shared Mobility Data Resource Guide. Next slide. And it's basically uh, provides a curated guide, and that's probably the key word is curated for existing reference material. There's tons and tons of material out there about uh, shared mobility and all aspects of shared mobility. Uh, the different kinds of shared mobility, the different questions, public and private sector, examples of sample data, examples of public websites, uh, web articles, blogs, resource guides that have been published. There's, a, there's tons of data out there. So this is the serve as a starting point to help guide people in the, in the directions to valuable data 
that, that uh, to help answer the questions that you might have. So the intended audience for this guide is basically primarily public sector uh, staff, both management and staff, uh, those who are using the data, uh, whether it's be directly with mobility operations or for the broader planning purposes that I talked about earlier. Um, and also uh, it should uh, assist regardless of whether your agency is managing the data internally, or as we'll talk about more and some of our uh, guest speakers will certainly talk about whether they are opting to contract out for the management and analysis of the data that's collected to manage mobility data services. Next slide. Um, so the resource guide uh, covers 40 different references um, over a broad variety of topics and the topics covered by each reference are identified. Um, the, the topics covered are, are referenced here, the three different types of applications that I mentioned, as well as uh, topics that cut across regardless of what application you're interested in, data sharing policies and practices, uh, the use of third parties, as I mentioned, uh, curb management, again, we'll hear more about that later today, is an emerging area where there's curb management data standards uh, for tracking what's, what's going on in the, in the infrastructure, as well as communicating with the public. And each and every reference is tagged and cross-referenced uh, both by the topics covered in that reference and also by the type. Is it, a, is it literature? Is it an online blog article? Is it a sample contract or, or licensing agreement? Or is it standards or a software tool? We also have uh, reference summaries for various organizations that may be of interest to people running shared mobility services and sample data sets. Next slide. And then the, uh, this is an example of a subset of the table that's early on in the resource guide. It's all, the, the underlines are all hyperlinked uh, within the guide. So for example, this is the, the subsect of the table for if you're interested in finding out more about communicating shared mobility services with the public. Uh, these are the various uh, guides or, or I'm sorry, references that are included in the guide uh, and by topic or by type, whether they're research or online resources, standards efforts, organizations, data sets, uh, all of them are hyperlinked for quick and easy reference. Next slide. And basically the actual details on each reference for the curated guide is a one page summary. This is half of the page. The next slide will have the, the, the second half on the right is a box that always highlights the, the various topic areas, since most of the resources cover more than one topic, what type it is, the author, when it came out, where to get it, most of these are online, uh, a very short description, uh, a quick summary of the data, and then next slide. And then additional details. And the additional details varies uh, by the type of reference or the specific reference as to what's included in the additional details. This particular example came from a guide to privacy from the Open Mobility Foundation. Uh, you'll be hearing more from uh, the Open Mobility Foundation later today, later on in this talk. Um, and so this, this particular one, the additional details provided is an outline of what you'll find in that guide for, uh, for privacy and shared mobility data. Okay, next slide. The second product uh, coming out of this NCHRP project in this area is managing sensitive shared mobility data. Next slide. So as I mentioned, public agencies need data about the mobility services. They can't really do their job without that data. Uh, and it needs to be adequately detailed and it needs to be timely if they're to fulfill their missions, whether that's managing operations, whether that's enforcing the rules, or whether that's longer range planning for transportation planning, for integration with transit, they have a legitimate need for, for adequately detailed data. And as I mentioned also at the same time, um, there's legitimate concerns about protecting user privacy. Uh, and there's a lot in the, in the literature about that. There's less, but equally important, is that other data generates concerns about protecting vendors' proprietary data. Uh, when you collect it, uh, does that become uh, a topic that then other parties could then use open records laws to access 
and get proprietary information about a particular private company's private data. So when we use the term sensitive data to refer both to data that affects a user's privacy, as well as that may be proprietary data from a particular vendor. Next slide. So now looking specifically at privacy, not looking at um, proprietary data, this is a table that comes out directly from the report. And it looks at, at different types of data and how that may relate to whether or not it reveals personal information. And there's four categories here. The first is kind of obvious, the direct identifiers, if you're collecting names, address, social security numbers, credit card numbers, uh, then that uh, definitely is a direct identifier that has personal information. It's clearly sensitive. Uh, for micromobility, there's really not a need for the public agencies to collect this data. Mobility service providers certainly need it. They need to know their customers' names, their billing information, et cetera. Uh, but when it comes to uh, TNCs and taxi services, some public agencies have determined that they want to collect data about the drivers, not the users, but the drivers, and they do collect personal information uh, about the drivers. Indirect identifiers is information that does not directly identify someone, but it can easily be coupled with other data uh, or other information in order to individually identify someone, and that's why it's sensitive. Uh, that can be things like the date of birth, the internet protocol IP address, someone is using to access the network to access apps or services, as well as geolocation data, such as where did a trip start or where did it end. Um, and the, uh, the trade-off here is that for some public agency applications, some use cases, you do need, you do need fairly precise geolocated trip information, but if it's too detailed, it, it can reveal sensitive information, so it needs to be adequately protected. And then the last two, uh, data that cannot be linked to an individual, properly aggregated data, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, survey results, uh, that's not uh, sensitive if it's properly aggregated so that you can't de-aggregate it, and if it's properly anonymized so that it can't be combined with other information to be re-identified. And that's a lot trickier than you might think. Uh, and that's one of the areas where you have to be particularly careful about that's talked about in this report. And then there's data not related to individuals. Maybe you're interested, you know, how much is your bike sharing used in the rain versus the snow versus clear weather? Weather data is not sensitive. You don't have to worry about that. Um, that kind of, where, where are your docking locations? That's something you know that doesn't reveal personal information. So those are the four types of data. Next slide. And as I mentioned, you need to be careful, especially about data that you think has been anonymized, either through aggregation or through anonymization, if it's not done properly. Uh, it's not an area to just roll your own and decide that you can, you can figure out a way to do that. Uh, and if it fails, uh, that can cause embarrassment for the agency, loss of trust for the public in your agency, and it can actually be harmful to individuals if their personal data is released. And highlighted here are just three uh, examples of cases where that's, that's occurred. Uh, there's a fairly infamous case, uh, New York City Taxi Cab had a database where it had medallion data for the taxi cab drivers. Uh, they did a process called hashing to hide the particular medallion identities of those drivers and hopefully the trips. Unfortunately, there's patterns in that data that let people fairly quickly re-identify that data. Uh, and then in the, in the bottom picture, letting see how celebrities tip, people took trip data, origin destination data, and you couldn't do this for you or I because people don't run around taking our pictures, but for celebrities, there's paparazzi. And there's tons of public pictures on the web that can be linked to particular times and locations. And by linking those with individual taxi cab trips, they were able to identify what celebrity took that taxi cab trip. And then they can look at their credit card information and determine how much they tipped by credit card. Uh, obviously not something that they uh, necessarily wanted revealed. Uh, lower right, similarly, it turns out that there's a, an adult entertainment facility that's fairly isolated in its location. 
So someone looked at the taxi trips that originated at that location in the early morning hours, 1, 2 a.m. in the morning, tracked that to where did the taxi cabs leave people off. Some of those were isolated enough that they were able to identify, they did not reveal these in the news stories, but they were able to actually identify specific customers of these adult uh, clubs from getting, they left an adult club where their addresses were. And then once they had their address, they could track other trips from other taxi trips that were made by those same people, obviously a, a privacy invasion. And then last at the upper top, um, that uh, public bike data that was shared uh, for London that just had origin destination data. But again, if you get enough data about origins and destinations, it's possible some of the time at least to identify individuals and what trips that they are making. So you have to be very careful when you aggregate data or anonymize data that you do it properly. So this type of thing doesn't happen to your agency. Next slide. Um, so the goal of the guidebook is to basically be an awareness and a first sort of level, a primer on the issues relating to protecting sensitive information. The, the guidebook, if you read the guide, you're not gonna be an expert. Frankly, I'm not an expert in all aspects of this area by any means, uh, but it will give sufficient depth so you'll be familiar with the issues you need to worry about. You won't be blindsided by issues. And in addition, you'll have enough knowledge that when you again go talk to interested parties and experts that you should be talking to, whether those are the mobility service providers in your area, researchers who want access to that data, privacy advocacy groups, as well as the folks within your own agency that you need to be talking to about protecting the data, your IT staff, your cybersecurity specialists, your lawyers for legal requirements, you'll, you'll, you can have an intelligent conversation instead of basically starting out blind and not knowing what the issues are or what these terms mean and, and why it's important. And it's a pretty short and easily read guide, I think. So you'll, it can be easily read in its entirety as, as a primer, and then you can go back to it as a reference guide to look up information on specific topics. Next slide. Um, this is uh, also straight from the, uh, from the book, from the guidebook. It's the context diagram. The boxes are basically the different parties that are involved. The, the lines are the data that flows from one to the other. Dash lines are where data may or may not flow. Solid lines are where data, you know, that where there's options for different paths. Uh, and in the guidebook, you'll see it talks about each of the different uh, elements, the mobility service providers, the public agencies who may or may not use a mobility data solution provider to manage and analyze their data, other public agencies that may want your data, uh, law enforcement agencies, which are sort of a special case of other public agencies. And the numbers basically in the guidebook, it talks through each of these interfaces uh, by number, what type of data flows through each interface and what are the uh, issues regarding the sensitivity of the data flowing through there. So this is the context diagram that forms uh, one of the foundations for the way that the guidebook uh, is organized. Next slide. And then the, the topics that are addressed in the guide, I'll cover in my last two slides on, on this and the next page. It talks about sensitive information. What do we mean by that? Why is it sensitive? As we've talked about uh, in this uh, presentation today, it talks about the interrelationship between privacy and cybersecurity. Those are heavily overlapping but distinct areas. There's certainly uh, topics that apply both to cybersecurity and privacy. Encryption, for example, is a tool that can help protect privacy, that can help provide cybersecurity, uh, but there's other things that really in cybersecurity don't relate to privacy, and there's areas in privacy that don't really relate uh, to, uh, to cybersecurity. Uh, it lays out a four-step process and walks the, the reader through it for looking at the data. The four steps are to start with determining your data needs. Uh, you may remember in the early days of, of big data, when that was first becoming a thing, you let a, a lot of articles advise, gather everything, you know, get everything possible. You never know when you might need it. It might be useful later, if not immediately, just grab everything. That has some appeal. It's a pretty horrible idea if you're concerned about protecting uh, privacy or proprietary data. Um, 
you know, the, the more data you collect, the more data that's transmitted, the more data that you're storing, the more data you're giving different groups access to, the more you have exposure to leaking private data or proprietary data. So the idea of, I mentioned earlier, you really don't need credit card information as a public agency from the users of a shared scooter service. Uh, you know, there's no reason to collect that. Why would you ever? And not that, not that agencies do, because they know they don't need that. But that's an example. Don't collect everything. Start by determining what are, you, what, what are the data needs. And that involves what are the use cases? Um, what are you going to use the data for? What data do you need to, to, uh, for each use case? Uh, and then once you have that list of all the data you need for the various use cases, and there'll be lots of overlap with the same data elements are needed for multiple use cases, then you can go through those element by element uh, and identify what's the sensitive data in there. And you can uh, potentially use something like that table I had earlier. This is directly uh, personal information. This is sensitive indirect information like geocoded uh, or trip origin or destination data, or no, this data has no sensitivity. I don't really have to worry about it from a sensitive data perspective and do that for each data element. Um, then your agency, your, probably your, your broad government agency, your local city or town or whatever, probably already has some broad policies on sensitive data that you need to follow. And you basically may want to expand upon those or build upon those, uh, looking specifically at shared mobility, looking at what are your guiding principles. Uh, it dives, the, the guidebook dives into some selected aspects more, and it provides references to a number of privacy principles and policies that different agencies already have in use or different groups have already put together as recommended policies and practices that you should consider adopting. Next slide. And then finally, it gives a, uh, an overview of, the, uh, of some of the protection controls and methods that might be put in place to ad address protecting data. Uh, that includes access controls, who has access to the data, who you share data with, what data is, is shared, your data retention rules, how long do you keep the data? Um, and, and, you know, and that involves, from the earlier steps, why are you keeping the data? What might you use it for? As well as policies. I, I know, for example, Los Angeles has rules that data that's used to help them make broad policy decisions must be retained for a certain number of years. So even if your mobility service, immediate operations doesn't need the data later, if it was used for policy decision, you may need to keep it for that number of years in LA, uh, but you don't need to keep it longer. I've already mentioned encrypting data, whether that be in transmission or in storage, various techniques to take this data that that's potentially could be re-identified and how to ensure that it can't be re-identified, or at least if you can't ensure it, at least make it much more difficult through various uh, processes that are described in the data, anonymizing the data, aggregating the data. Uh, if you're doing origin destination data and at whatever level you're doing that at, there's very few uh, trips that might be revealing too much information about who's making those trips and where they're going from that area. So maybe instead of block level data in that particular area, you need to aggregate multiple blocks together in order to protect people's privacy. Uh, and an emerging uh, concept called differential privacy. So that's a quick overview of what's in uh, this guide. Uh, should mention that both these guides, they're, they're in the publication process as are the other reports coming out of this NCHRP project. We don't have a date yet for when they'll be published, but we hope they'll be forthcoming soon and wanted to, again, let you know what's in there uh, and what's coming and hopefully those will be of use to you. Um, so at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to hear, we'll hear from each one of our panelists and then have some shared questions and answers, um, starting with Angela Giacchetti. So Angela, I'm gonna turn it over to you now. Great, thank you. And thanks for that amazing overview. Um, let me just get my screen up. Let's see. All right, everyone can see my slides, I hope. <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks again, Mike, for the overview. Um, I think a lot of folks who are experts in this space um, will admit that in you know such an emerging and um, ever-changing space, we're all learning all the time. Um, so thanks for creating that resource. Um, 
My name is Angela Giacchetti, and I work for the Open Mobility Foundation. Um, I'll try not to repeat um, too much of that amazing overview, um, but my goal is to really give you uh, give you all an overview of the Open Mobility Foundation and the data standards that we manage. So um, a little bit of, of um, the pipeline between um, some of the entities that deal with mobility data. So for context, I think it's no secret to us all that transportation systems are rapidly changing and have been rapidly changing and really incorporate more and more digitally enabled ways of getting around. So everything from um, ride sharing and e-scooters to uh, now autonomous vehicles and delivery robots. Um, and traditionally we've measured and managed this through physical infrastructure. Um, but as these connected services play a bigger role in our lives and frankly impact um, cities in, in new ways, um, cities really need ways of managing them to ensure that everyone in our communities has their needs met in safe, equitable, and environmentally sustainable ways. So that is the spirit of the Open Mobility Foundation. We are a nonprofit that provides um, open source solutions for cities to really address those policy needs. We're a city-led membership organization, um, and we bring together public agencies, um, primarily cities, but also counties and MPOs, as well as private uh, sector stakeholders to create these tools in an open source environment. So that means that um, we build freely available tools that are developed through a transparent collaborative process, and that's open source. Um, so over 50 cities and transit organizations are members, as are more than a dozen private companies, including um, operators and technology companies. Um, you can see a sampling of them here, and you can see all of them on our website, um, but our members are really a huge part of how we kind of make it happen. Um, and we also get support from philanthropic foundations like Rockefeller and Knight. Um, we steward two main data standards. MDS and CDS. Um, and again, as I mentioned, these are all built through this um, collaborative process that involves all stakeholders. Um, there are several benefits to this, um, including you know, transparency and the ability to evolve the standards over time. Um, we steward two main standards, MDS and CDS. So um, MDS is, stands for the Mobility Data Specification which is a digital tool that really helps cities manage transportation, um, shared transportation in the public right of way. So MDS standardizes communication and data sharing between cities and private mobility providers, such as you know, e-scooters and bike share companies. Um, that is how we got our start, but the spec uh, has evolved since then. Um, the spec also allows cities to share and validate policy digitally enabling vehicle management and better outcomes for residents. Um, plus it provides mo mobility service providers um, a framework that they can reuse in new markets. So this allows for, um, for kind of easier collaboration that saves time and money. So instead of um, a mobility service provider providing data to you know, 300 cities in a bespoke format, cities that use MDS are all using the same format. So that makes it easy on their providers as well. Um, MD, at its core, MDS is really a kind of blueprint for APIs. And that creates this kind of standardized two-way communication for cities and private companies to share information about their operations and you know, allow cities to collect that information. Um, it's now being used by more than 180 cities around the world to plan transportation infrastructure, support and regulate shared mobility, um, and advance policy goals um, like equity, sustainability, things like that. Um, and that's all the cities that we know about because it's an open standard and it's freely available for everyone to use. Um, we don't actually, you know, it could be being used by many more cities, uh, but these are the ones that we're aware of. And you can actually see all of them on our website and kind of um, see some of the policy documentation. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, MDS was originally developed to help cities manage um, dockless micromobility programs, so shared bikes and dockless e-scooters, but 
with the latest version that was released this year, MDS 2.0, it's now also being used more widely um, in car share programs, with taxis and other passenger services, including, um, you know, many cities are exploring this as a possible solution for autonomous vehicles, including like robo taxis, um, delivery robots, and it can really be adapted for use in other emerging modes. So that was the kind of design philosophy with MDS is that, um, you know, we'd start with, with the kind of um, the problem in front of us, which at the time was uh, managing dockless micromobility, but really that it would be built in a way that could allow cities to better adapt to a variety of emerging modes. Um, so because my background is a little bit less technical than some of my colleagues who, you know, are computer engineers and developers, um, I like to use analogies for describing MDS. So um, my favorite being the concept of a kind of digital plumbing layer, as you can see in this diagram. So um, MDS data is generated by shared mobility devices. So it includes information about the status of vehicles, their location, um, and the trips that they take, but it also provides a digital mechanism um, for cities to communicate rules and regulations to those mobility operators. So this includes things like vehicle caps, distribution requirements, um, no parking zones, restricted areas, deployment fees, and other types of policy rules. So that means that MDS is a two-way street when it comes to data, and yes, that is a pun. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, you know, this is all created in a kind of collaborative environment that's open to the public. So if you're interested, you can join a working group meeting, kind of see where the discussion is at and weigh in. Um, and while our organization kind of stewards the development process, the MDS spec itself evolves through those contributions from dozens of people from many different organizations, two of which you'll hear from today. And, you know, we really believe that this open source approach benefits both cities and companies by creating a space that they can come together, collaborate, co-create, and ultimately this reduced costs. Um, and it nurtures a kind of healthy competitive ecosystem for um, both mobility services and also the software tools, the technology companies that are helping cities um, manage these programs. Um, so while data is an effective tool for a variety of use cases, you know, to help cities meet their policy goals, data collected about mobility should be considered um, for those privacy protections that Mike had mentioned. So that's why a big part of our mission is also to um, serve as a kind of community of practice and really equip cities with the support and the resources that they need um, to keep that information safe and secure. So to kind of develop appropriate practices for protecting privacy, handling data, organizations using MDS should really understand how and why it's used, what resources are available to support and enhance privacy. Um, and some of these are listed here, there's links. Um, so we have a privacy, security and transparency committee that um, develops resources, provides privacy guidance for MDS users. Um, our privacy guide covers a lot of in-depth of what Mike had discussed at a high level, gives real examples from real cities um, that can serve as a kind of inspiration or jumping off point. Um, our privacy committee has also created um, with legal counsel a guide for using MDS under GDPR, um, which is the European Privacy Protection, um, and MDS is GDPR compliant, um, but again, there's some kind of considerations that cities need to make um, when implementing to make sure that they have, um, have the right kind of protections and policies in place. But just to kind of understand how the data flows, as you can see in this chart, data describing the status of vehicles passes securely from the company operating the mobility service to the city. So never directly from riders. So this doesn't, um, MDS doesn't contain information from, for example, the cell phone of someone riding a, a vehicle. Um, and there's several types of information that the company has like rider data and financial data that is not included in MDS. Um, so um, yeah, MDS doesn't cont contain, you know, payment information, name, contact information, things of that nature. Um, and then we recommend the further processing of MDS data before it's made public. 
So really, you know, MDS is this tool for cities to use, but it in and of itself is not really designed to be published publicly without further processing. And there are lots of companies and, you know, and some cities that have done this by further processing their data have created open data portals. Actually, Michael from Ride Report, um, they have a great product that um, that publishes open data um, and, and can be a really awesome tool as well. Um, so we won't get too far into this, but the other data standard that we steward, um, CDS or the curb data specification, uh, was created as a kind of complement to MDS. So while MDS addresses the kind of status of vehicles um, in, uh, in movement or on, on um, streets, um, the curb data specification um, helps cities and companies pilot and scale dynamic curb zones. So it provides a mechanism for um, expressing static and dynamic regulation. So that's kind of shorthand for coding the curb and being able to publish curb policies digitally in a computer readable format, measuring activity at the curb. So things like um, pick up drop off or um, loading zone activity, and then really developing policies that create more accessible, useful curbs in a kind of metrics layer that does common calculations for things like dwell time. Um, and while this isn't the focus of today, you can maybe imagine how these specs can work together, especially when it comes to passenger services, um, for cities to both um, kind of have an understanding of how those services are operating on streets, but also how those services are utilizing curbs and really create more useful um, curb space for those types of services. Um, so before I wrap things up, um, I want to give you some real life examples of the spec. Um, out in the wild, but we're also going to hear from Michael and Sharda, um, you know, how they use MDS um, to kind of support public transportation um, kind of policies. Um, so I'll start with this uh, quick use case. They're, they're both, no, they're not both from the city of Chicago. This one is from the city of Chicago. So um, as you might know, cities often set up kind of priority areas or equity zones to ensure that services available in like low income neighborhoods or other areas of interest. So the charts here show that availability in Chicago's priority areas was higher in the morning um, when the fleets were set up for morning commutes. But later in the day, after riders take those vehicles to different areas, operators are not rebalancing in those priority areas. So there's less availability there in the rest, you know, during the rest of the day. And the only way that the, the kind of city is able to measure that is by using MDS and really seeing, okay, we have an issue with distribution in our equity areas. Um, and this is all found, there's several public reports that uh, utilize MDS data for this. Um, the other example comes from Louisville, Kentucky. Um, so again, as I mentioned, cities can use MDS to publish policy for operators around restricted areas, no parking zones, things like that. Um, so the restricted, uh, you can see that there's a restricted area um, that was communicated through MDS around the American Printing House for the Blind Campus, um, where visually impaired students and workers couldn't, um, you know, they wanted to limit um, sidewalk riding and parking of uh, e-scooters and then other no parking areas were for the waterfront park area um, along the river, which is just a pedestrian walkway. Um, and then speed restriction policies were included um, there and then the main university campus to the south. Um, and so you can see how cities are also using MDS to communicate back out to operators, you know, different kind of um, restricted speed areas and things like that. Um, so yeah. That is, that's it for me. Um, as you might have gathered, we um, were huge nerds dealing with mobility data, but you know, ultimately, we're developing these tools with the kind of bigger mission of really helping cities um, transform the way that they manage infrastructure and mobility in the modern era, and really can keep pace with um, with changing mobility services and the changing landscape. So. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to hand it over um, next to uh, to two of our members to talk about um, how they use the tools and um, and how they really use data to um, yeah to help meet city policy goals. 
Thanks, Angela. Um, before we turn it over to uh, to Michael, my my apologies to Angela. I got I got on a roll there and turned it over quickly. I wanted to hear from you and I forgot to give you your background. So for purposes uh, for the, for the audience, so they'll know. Um, in addition to our current work as the Director of Engagement at Open Mobility Foundation, as you heard, uh, she's a strategic leader with more than a decade of experience across public and private sector. Uh, before joining the Open Mobility Foundation, um, she held a senior staff position for a member of Congress, managing a team responsible for constituent services, community outreach, and local policy priorities. Uh, and in addition to, to that role earlier, she had a communications and community management background at various organizations, including BIRD, Eventbrite, and Planned Parenthood of New Jersey. She's a cum laude honors graduate of the State University of New York at Purchase College, where she got a, her Bachelor of Arts in Gender Studies and Political Science. So my apologies for not leading with that, Angela. Don't oh, <laughs> worry. So the audience knows uh, a little bit more about you. Uh, and then now we'll turn it over to uh, Michael uh, Schwartz, who I will give his bio in a timely manner. Uh, Michael's the CEO of Ride Report. Uh, he's grown the company from its pre-revenue phase up to more than 75 paying customers. Customers here are local agencies uh, with a footprint in more than 100 shared mobility markets. Um, he has more than 20 years of experience in transportation. Uh, he has been part of the development and governments of new standards, including the work of the Open Mobility Foundation, the mobility data specification, as well as the curb data specification that you just heard about, uh, as well as complex technical and privacy related considerations of ingesting, visualizing, and sharing large and sensitive data. Uh, Michael's created and implemented his vision of a customer obsessed company, providing the tools, expertise, and technical support that public agency staff needs to meet their goals in today's transportation technology landscape. His work in the public, private, and nonprofit advocacy sectors informs his wide-ranging perspectives on data sharing. So now we'll hear more about both Ride Report and those perspectives. Michael, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks, Mike. Let me just pull up my screen. Okay, you all can see my screen, I'm hoping. Um, so thanks so much. These presentations are great. Um, really nice to have that high level and was neat to hear kind of how far we've come. Um, so that's really what I'm going to focus on today. Uh, just to give a little more color to, to Mike's introduction, um, Ride Report is a, is a software platform and we do, we help cities and uh, government agencies that are managing shared mobility programs as well as using the data for other purposes. And uh, I'm gonna do just a very quick retrospective uh, to give you all a sense of what it was like to kind of navigate a lot of the things that Mike outlined um, and how far we've come from when MDS was invented to, to where we are today. Um, so I call these the good old days of four or five years ago um, when scooters first fell out of the sky. Um, I think city agencies that were overseeing these programs really had um, a knee-jerk reaction of saying they, they, there wasn't a lot of trust. Um, I call it the Uber hangover where there was no data shared. And so they really requested a lot of data from these companies. Um, as Mike said, in addition to individual privacy, there was a lot of concern around um, company uh, data privacy. And so they did share the data. The difference between Uber and Lyft and scooters is that they were easily impounded. And so what that meant is that they couldn't quite skirt all the regulations um, and not share the data. And so in order to get permits, they did share data. Um, but in the beginning, it really was the Wild West. Every city asked for a custom spreadsheet with their own set of fields and data they wanted to see, um, which created a lot of work for each, each provider. Um, sensitive data was being emailed uh, all over the place, all kinds of things that I'm sure are not in Mike's guide for best practices. Um, cities didn't have their use cases defined yet. It was so new that they didn't really know. They just knew they wanted the data and they would figure out what they would do next. Um, and then there was really a lack of holistic view. Since individual operators were sending their own data, 
Um, it took an extra set of work to figure out how to aggregate it. Maybe some operators had had one methodology for what, how they shared the data. Maybe other operators had a different one. And so it was really just a lot of manual work to get to any sort of understanding about these programs. And so what happened is uh, with the mobility data specification, it allowed a company like ours to really start to create solutions. So having the data is one thing, making the data actionable is something completely different. So uh, there's a whole process around ingesting mobility uh, data specification data and curve data specification data um, that um, cities and companies like ours have, have learned how to do. Um, and then there's taking it and turning it into different uh, pieces um, that we've used to, for, for management. And to that privacy piece, um, the nice thing is all the stuff that's to the right and, and on the bottom of this slide can be on the other side of the sensitive data. So we can aggregate it up um, either geographically or uh, by time or by um, quantity minimum thresholds. And in that way, you can have useful actionable data, which covers really like 99% of the use cases. Um, and nobody has to see the raw data, which is much more sensitive, both from an individual privacy as well as a, a company uh, proprietary data sensitivity. And so just to give a couple of examples, um, this is actually in DC. I, I don't want to steal Sharda's thunder because I'm sure she, she's going to talk about some of this, but they passed um, some policies around not having too many vehicles on a particular block face because it was getting a little bit overcrowded or maybe a lot bit overcrowded. Um, and so we're able to create uh, and actually our, our um, D DC DOT staff can actually create these uh, areas within them. Uh, create policy saying we'll have a maximum for each number of operators. And then we actually in turn receive the data from the operators to understand their compliance with this. Uh, and so this is really where Angela was talking about the two way uh, flow of data. We communicate it out to the operators. They can then ingest it, put it into their tools, make sure their scooters are responding uh, appropriately. And then we understand the compliance uh, over time. Um, and then beyond sort of day-to-day -day management, there's also sort of program evaluation. Some of the stuff that Angela was saying that showing in Chicago, uh, which again is really much more about, um, you know, how's the program doing overall? Stats like what time of day, day of week are things happening? Um, and then it allows you to do some other pretty neat things. Um, so on the right here is a parking, uh, a bicycle parking and scooter parking recommendation engine. So it takes all the trip ends um, and deployment events of the operators and says, here's where you tend to have clusters. That's the, the small green and red dots. And then the larger green circles are basically the number of racks needed to accommodate that number of shared mobility devices. So this helps staff understand, well, this is where we need more infrastructure uh, to make sure we can have people park uh, not all over the sidewalk. And so uh, th this is a really neat thing. And it, again, allows you to um, show trip ends, which in and of themselves are not sensitive. It's really the connected origins and destinations, uh, particularly over enough enough time frame. Um, and then the other thing, just to kind of compare again um, with where we were to where we are, um, sort of static reports versus real time. So you can see up here or um, on the left side, there's a date range. So you can just pull up that data in a very quick custom way. Um, let's say you get a question from your supervisor or the public. Um, you don't have to wade through the data figure out how to clean it up and make it actionable. It's just sort of ready right there at your fingertips. And that's really new for shared mobility and, and particularly non-motorized uh, non uh, transportation, active transportation. Um, I know uh, Mike and uh, Angela were talking about our public dashboard and, and public dashboards in general, making the data public. So this was a use case that we thought was really important. Um, and we worked really closely with the operators as well as cities to say, how do we create a dashboard that is, um, sufficiently aggregated such that the data is really no longer sensitive. And so we actually created um, a public data portal. We call it the Shared Mobility Index. Uh, if you go to public.ridereport.com, you can see we actually have, um, I wanna say we're over, we're somewhere between 60 and 70 cities in there um, and over 200 million trips. Um, and you can compare different cities as you can see here on the left to look at um, you know, how, how cities compare to each other, which is another advantage. Um, and Mike, I gotta say, there's one more arrow you could draw, which is we're from a shared mobility data provider, we're going directly to the public. Um, and that allows us to have data from multiple cities rather than being from a local public agency. So that's probably a new use case um, that, that might not have been part of, of your research. Um, and then similarly, you can have um, advocacy use cases. So on the right here, um, this is Denver, Colorado, and they were able to see that there was a street that was getting as much 
uh, shared micromobility usage as ones where they had protected bike lanes. This is um, Blake Street where Coors Field is. And so they were able to actually prioritize building new bicycle infrastructure based on scooter data, uh, which is pretty neat to see. Uh, and uh, it, it helped uh, accelerate that and get it done very quickly. Um, and so Angela and I are at this conference here, Commotion, and there's been a lot of talk of how do you use uh, the, the data that's being collected for more than just management. So that was really the use case. That's what allowed people to get their foot in the door, really helped the ecosystem um, of the Open Mobility Foundation take off. But we are really trying to move from um, growing our data sets from beyond e-bikes and scooters. Um, we, we've done mopeds, car share, we have freight and delivery now. Um, and then there's this management piece that we already sort of have in our tools in the middle. But we're really trying to move to the right to where we can start to show outcomes and really interesting things with the data that are are core to what cities are trying to achieve. So multimodal uh, project evaluation, um, things like safety and really understanding, okay, what's the exposure of people to, to traffic and how does this un how, how can this help drive our vision zero plans? Um, carbon and emissions, um, bringing in third party data. So there's really just a lot of really neat use cases and we're just really starting to get there. I feel like we're in this new phase of, of how to use this data. Um, so just to show you a few things that, that we're working on, um, you can see we have a, a, car, a carbon emission tracker here on the left that kind of takes um, the number of trips and figures out, okay, well, what, what's the carbon saved by, by using shared micromobility? Um, we have a counts program, um, which is uh, on the right here, which is we're ingesting um, actually video uh, camera based counts. And then we're able to layer that data on top of ours where we can show here's the shared micromobility data. Here's the total micromobility data. You subtract one from the other and you get the private data um, so you're able to understand what the mix is on the street and then starting to really estimate network-wide counts uh, for all shared micromobility data. Um, impacts, I'm going to show you in just a minute. That's the project evaluation, uh, which has been really exciting and, and is, is the only one of these things that's fully operational and, and less in a, a building phase. And then um, something we're starting with the city of Portland is um, private and freight data. So really looking at building out the curb data to be able to share that with operators and then getting um, actually working with a bicycle logistics company. So people who do these sort of e-trike deliveries called Beeline, um, helping to bring their data into MDS and CDS. So you get a much more holistic picture, get some of those really neat charts and graphs to understand what is going on with last mile delivery in a way that we really haven't before and be able to tell some of those same stories that I was showing for, around scooters and bikes. Um, so we developed this module called Impact. So this is um, a use case again from uh, our city customers where, you know, oftentimes evaluation can be really labor intensive. It's just really hard to get the data, to process it, clean it. Um, and then you do it once and then it literally is over. Um, so we did a prototype in Denver uh, where we were able to look at really the, the most interesting parts of MDS. So this uh, on the top left here, we call this a ride shed. And this is looking at a protected bike lane that went in. Um, and this is 14th street and uh, when it, where it went in, we were able to look at, okay, for all the trips that pass through that corridor, where else are they riding? And you're able to look at essentially, um, you know, a, a, I think they call them spider, spider maps, um, select links, that, that sort of thing, um, to be able to see, okay, what, what is the, the citywide impact of a facility like this, this that it reaches well beyond just the local neighborhood. Um, and then we also have real, real stats, um, top level stats, and those are kind of the goal is to have those constantly updating. So if it's a, you know, not just three months after the project's built, but six months, nine months, 12 months. Um, and so I know I showed you um, Blake Street earlier. Um, this is 23rd Avenue in, in the bottom right. Um, so a neat thing about that is we use shared micromobility data to justify Blake Street in Denver. We're gonna turn around and evaluate it and do an impact page on it. Um, there's already one up for right after it opened. And then we're gonna do another one um, for six months after it opens um, to try to understand, okay, what, what has changed since people started um, using these facilities. Um, we're also going to launch just next week um, an evaluation of events. So um, this is Austin City Limits in Austin, Texas, uh, which is people know tons of people come from really all over the country, but definitely all over the area to be able to come to this facility. And they um, it's impressive how shared mo mobility can really help so that not everybody drives in their own car. And so they've set up a whole set of, of staging locations and all sorts of things. And we're going to be able to show uh, with impacts kind of what happened and the success of it compared um, to previous years, um, as well as over time um, versus sort of standard days. 
Um, so thank you so much. Really appreciate your time and really excited for the discussion. I'm going to hand it over. Uh, I think Mike is going to introduce Sharda now. Thanks, Michael. Really uh, appreciate that presentation. So we've heard from uh, an organization that was founded by public sector agencies, involves the public and private sector uh, in setting standards, the Open Mobility Foundation, then Michael representing a uh, data management company uh, for managing data on behalf of the public uh, sector. And now we're going to hear from Sharda Strassmore from a public sector agency and get, uh, get her perspective as a public sector uh, agency manager uh, in this whole area. Sharda was the shared micromobility planner at the District Department of Transportation for Washington, DC. Uh, her portfolio on dockless bike and scooter share, including managing the current permit, the permit process, uh, imagining dockless programs for the future at the, at the time, and planning how uh, new mobility can coexist in public space. Uh, her, her current position is she is the budget analyst in the deputy mayor's office for operations and infrastructure focused on allocating resources. And her most recent work has been on an equity-based automated traffic enforcement task force and planning for fleet uh, electrification in the district. And with that, uh, I'll turn it over uh, to you, Sharda. Thank you. Um, so I don't have a presentation to share. Um, so I'm happy to keep an eye on the chat and the questions and answer them as I talk. Um, I wanna thank uh, the National Operations Center of Excellence, Mike and Kelly, for inviting me to participate in this discussion. And my goal is to give you some insights into the practical application of data practices from a government perspective, looking at an, at an evolving industry. Um, so if you want to take the slides down, you're welcome to do so, so that I can keep an eye on the chat. Um, so I was the uh, shared mobility planner in DC in 2019 um, when scooters were fresh to the district. Michael mentioned that we may have had an Uber hangover when it came to our data needs, um, which was very true because we developed our own data spe specifications along with using um, GBFS, the general bike share feed specification, um, which was a live feed of what was occurring. MDS is different because it allows you to see the historical analysis. And with GBFS, the only way to see that was to record it live from your side, from your perspective, using um, different data tools. Um, so we had a, a very wild west view. We developed our own data needs and data use cases and spread spreadsheets. Um, and it was always a challenge. Um, companies knew what the format was. Companies signed agreements, agreeing to submit it in the format, and yet had such high turnover that they were unable to do it month after month. Um, so the transition to, a, to an API, to a, a specified feed was great, um, to be quite honest, um, because we spent countless hours, I spent, let's be honest, <laughs> <laughs> countless hours each month going back to companies and being like, you're not in compliance, please fix your spreadsheets, which is no fun for anyone. Um, and we went from having nine, I think the, another perspective that I want to throw in there is that from 2019 to now, there's a lot of instability in the scooter industry. Um, there was a lot of venture capital funds that went into it and a lot of companies that then had to that went public or had to show profitability to their investors. Um, and so there was a lot of shrinkage and not a lot of stability. Um, so it definitely played a role in how a city could rely upon micromobility, shared micromobility as a option for um, for its users, for, for citizens and, and tourists moving around. Um, I was lucky that in DC, we already had data classification levels. Um, we had open and public, not proactively released and for government use and confidential and restricted confidential. And this was something that had already been developed prior to, to shared scooters even existing. And so we attempted um, to use both a um, in-house solution for data management and a um, dashboard solution. And so, 
just if anyone's thinking about or is an in-house engineer, it was a lot of work. Um, I was very thankful to the people that I asked very nicely to, to help us out. Um, but they had to program, um, they had to create data pipelines and program the way the data was flowing into the city, into the, um, into the, into the database. They had to structure it. They had to have secure cloud storage. We had to access it on the back end. Um, and it was just, it was, it was a lot of work, um, to get to a point where the, uh, where the data coming in was even able to be like used and recorded. So I am very thankful for the types of products that Michael and Ride Report have um, and Populous and other companies that are able to do this work, especially for cities that are not as well resourced as Washington, DC. Um, so I see in the question, um, how to encourage, um, I'm going to go with Zong, Zong Ren's question first. Um, are redacted raw data available with no concerns for privacy for sharing with the research community? Um, when I was the shared micromobility planner, we did not share raw data with researchers. Um, we collected it and sometimes broke it apart so that the origins and destinations were separate um, and, the, and also tried to aggregate it to a greater level. Um, there's definitely the opportunity to enter into research agreements. Um, and data was not shared without those research agreements. I think it depends on the organization that you're working with. Um, and I would also say that in DC, we have very, um, our FOIA laws are different, um, but like a city like Seattle and in, in, um, they have very different sunshine laws. And so they even ran, yes, university researchers. Um, and so they even ran into having a secondary facility to hold their data in order to prevent the leaking of um, of privacy data. So yeah, university researchers, um, it's hard because you have to reach out to individual cities. I'm gonna work with them to, to use the data, but I definitely did work with a lot of university researchers during my time as the micromobility planner. Um, and then I see another question, how to encourage agencies to invest in shared mobility with high car ownership rates and privacy culture. Um, and that's a very interesting question. Um, I think it's about the availability of infrastructure where people feel safe um, to travel. So in DC, we're very lucky that we've been building out our bike lane network for over 10 years. We have a lot of protected bike lanes. We have in the middle of our city, uh, the National Mall, which is a pedestrianized walkway where most, most of the tourists are. They're going from the Capitol to the Lincoln Monument. Um, and so we have a lot of space for people to be in our streets um, and to feel safe. And I think that is probably one of the greatest prevalences, reasons why we had such high rates of micromobility use. Um, so I'm going to wrap it up and go back to having, have a, have a, some time for the Q and A. Um, but thank you all. And I appreciate seeing your questions in the chat. Great. Thanks, Sharda. Um, yes. And, and as, as a reminder, some of you are already doing that, taking, typing questions in, in, uh, both in the chat and the Q and A, if you can put them in the Q and A, that'd be greatly appreciated as we get to, uh, to more questions. Um, I guess to uh, just to start with, uh, I'll just ask the other two panelists if, uh, if you have anything to, to add to what Charter has already uh, talked about in the way of the, the question of making uh, data, especially raw data available to university researchers. I, I can just say that, you know, from from my perspective, working with many, many cities, that's that's kind of been the norm. There's a lot of challenges that cities have in working with researchers. And um, I would love to see more uh, more of that happening. But I understand that there are, you know, there are lots of challenges. The data is um, or can be quite sensitive. And so um, I think it takes a lot of work to set up um, to set up a research project. And really, I, I encourage those, you know, in academia and in cities to really find where there is that alignment, where there could be, where there are studies that have that kind of public value and, and priorities are aligned so that it's, it's 
maybe more possible for that to happen, but um, it is, it's traditionally been quite challenging for a variety of reasons and um, we haven't seen a ton of it. Yeah, just to, to add to that, um, you know, right report, I mentioned that we aggregate to a level where there's a lack of sensitivity, both for our internal dashboard for city users, so that if they're using it and they share it, it's it's, it's not sensitive and it, it's allowed to kind of flow around their agency. And then also the public dashboard um, is really to the point where people can take a look at it. And I think what we've generally found with our operating partners is um, they really want to know the use case. So I think, you know, it, it's a little bit of a mismatch between researchers approach and, um, you know, where it meets the private sector, where they, they say, you know, you, you can't just wade through our data, um, especially this raw sense of data that's sensitive to us as a company, in addition to being sensitive to the end user, um, it can be very costly to deliver the data. Um, and so what generally, the part of the reason that we made the public dashboard um, is it helps, first of all, people like Sharda from not needing to constantly get requests from people. So there's a self-service component because you can actually download, again, very aggregated data it's at the quarterly level. Um, so it's not, you know, super refined, but it does have street segment level volumes um, and allows you to start to get a sense of, okay, what's in this, um, where might I want to go and start to refine your research question so that when you come back to make the request, um, because that is something that the operators do need to approve in addition to the cities, it's not really something that even cities can do on their own because it really is like raw, raw disaggregated data is, is something that um, the operators need to need to approve going to a third party. Um, unless there's a sort of a, a blanket agreement, maybe in the case of DDOT there is, um, then you can say, this is why I need this. Here's what I want to do. And oftentimes what we found is you can actually get to your research question without necessarily needing um, the level of disaggregation that you think you need to, to start. Um, not always, but but sometimes that's the case. And so that's somehow you can you can meet, meet partway. And I would also throw in there, my, as Michael said, your research questions are very important. Um, because it has to be of interest to the agency as well. Um, we wouldn't just be like, it's cool if you want to look at something that we're not interested in. So you, it has to be having the ability to refine it by having that previous access, I think makes a big difference. And so props to Michael and Ride Report for being able to pull that together um, so that we can get more refined requests. Because you can't use, when you have these data use agreements, they are like specifically for your research question. It's not like, oh, you can go run around and ask other things. And, and I see that uh, Angela's posted in the, the chat uh, web link uh, from the OMF with additional information for and resources for researchers. So if you're interested in that uh, question, uh, be sure to uh, check out the link for, in the uh, chat window. Uh, we have another question. Uh, until use cases and fact success stories are shared, how can this sector uh, flourish? So any, any thoughts is, is uh, where can people look to, to find out about success stories for shared mobility? Do you think enough is being done to share this or, or not enough being done? Uh, what are people's thoughts on that? I just put in another link in the chat that's related to that. So um, one of the things that we were really heartened to see early on um, in cities using MDS at scale was many of them produced reports that would not have been made possible without the use of data standardization and working with companies like Ride Report to make sense of that data and also you know, having kind of robust teams internally to analyze that data. So several cities have produced reports um, detailing their pilot programs or, um, or you know, their kind of full-fledged uh, micromobility programs. And I think that's a great success story um, and would love to see it with other modes as well. Um, and so I think that's one of the challenges with um, with modes outside of micromobility. So for example, like um, with autonomous vehicles, uh, would love for cities to be able to produce those same types of reports for that, for public transparency about how those programs are impacting communities in a variety of ways, both both uh, you know the good parts and and the potential um, negative externalities. Great, yeah, and um, just to add to that, you know, I think we we shared our our impacts page, um, and that's really part of what we're trying to do is share the success stories. Actually, one of the impacts from Denver is about their micro mobility program itself. They, they had a very long pilot, and then they relaunched, and it's um, you know up there with Washington D.C. is one of the uh, most used systems in the country, and so. Um, it, 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 it's a way to kind of tout those success stories. And that's exactly kind of the use case that, um, and, and what's interesting is 
we came from Uber and then the early micro mobility where there was no wish to share the data. And now actually the operators are very, very supportive of the public dashboard. They really want to see their data get out there for exactly your reason, because they can point to it and show their success, um, get a better understanding of, of the larger impact that the whole uh, trend is making. So I think that's a really, a really astute question. Great. Uh, we have a couple of questions uh, on uh, data retention policies, looking for sort of what, what's the landscape around that? What drives it? Is it fair to assume that that this is a city specific or are there any broader guidelines on data retention? Our privacy committee recently tried to tackle this topic uh, to really come up with uh, or to answer the question if there was kind of a a standard. And one of the things that's kind of interesting to bear in mind is that each city is subject to their own privacy rules and policies, um, you know, either at the municipal level or um, that are required by their state. And so, um, you know, there's a kind of variety of perspectives, but their cities are also, like I said, um, you know, kind of beholden to different, um, different laws around data retention and, and more generally privacy policies. Um, so there, you know, from from what we've understood, there is no um, there's no standard, and that is really because each city is has kind of different policies that they're subject to. Um, so yeah, it's uh, there. There's no there's no one um, one rule, but um, the other thing to consider in terms of retention is really what are you using the data for, and that really should um, should work hand in hand with how long you're retaining that data. Great. Um, okay, uh, I have a couple uh, questions as, as well for the uh, panel, uh, sort of going broader away from the, the privacy for a moment. Uh, the chair mobility sector, certainly like everything else in, in the world, experienced disruptions with uh, COVID. Uh, but then there's also been some news stories recently as some municipalities, which had been subsidizing micromobility services, decided, oh, they should stand on their own. And in some cases, that didn't really work out so well, and, and services stopped in, in those cities. Uh, any thoughts on the current health of micromobility services in the US and thoughts about uh, public sector subsidies or the need for them for these services? I feel yeah. like that. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> As he smiles, who goes first? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go really quickly. There's, there's been a couple of reports that have come out recently. I'll point you to, and I'll, I'll add something into the, into the chat. Um, both NAPSA, the North American Bike Share Association, and NACTO, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, each issue annual reports that talks about the health of um, the industry. And the general feeling is that um, in North America, um, it's pretty much back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, so it's, it's you know, exciting. Um, and, and growing from there, I think it looks different than it did before in, in 2019, but um, in that it's it's maybe um, it, there's fewer operators, that's for sure. Um, and then there are certain cities where there's sort of a lot of it. Um, some of the, the the market shape has changed just a little bit. Uh, but I think it's definitely here for the long for the long haul. Um, but I do think that it seems like there will be fewer uh, operators overall. There's a little bit of a consolidation happening. Um, and then I I think that, um, I can see in here, I'm just going to kind of go um, to the complement versus competitor to public transit, because I think that's a, a sort of piece of this story. Um, one really interesting thing about Dockless um, is that um, it's sort of a different pricing model often than the dock systems. And I think Shard is by the best position to answer this um, between Capital Bike Share and Scooters. But um, therefore, it's, it's not something that people use every day as a complement to get to and from transit. That said, um, it really becomes sometimes a connector. So if you take transit in um, in, the, in the early part of the day and you need to go somewhere else in the middle of the day, it can really help get you through that. So um, we've seen particularly with the change in travel patterns that um, there's not a huge morning commute bump, but then there's a really big kind of afternoon and evening um, bump that happens where people are clearly going other places and maybe connecting uh, to, to transit. Um, I think for very short trips, it can certainly be um, competitive in that way uh, depending on, on the transit system. Yeah, I kind of heard this question as in like, how do people pay for and ask for micromobility in their city? Um, and so just to talk about DC, we use a public right of way occupancy permit. Um, so 
DC is a city controls the land like between the front of your house, the middle of the street to the other side of the street. And in order to allow people to place vehicles, companies to place vehicles on the street, we have to give you an occupancy permit. And so that is how we choose to do it. But we also have our very rich capital bike share system, um, which is a station based system that is owned and operated by the city. Um, so the city pays a company to operate it. Um, and the pricing on that is very different as Michael mentioned from a scooter. You'd pay like for the same trip, you might pay $10 to ride a scooter and pay $2 for a capital bike share bike, but you have to return it to the same, to, to a bike share location. Um, and so it's a very fascinating mix of the types of trips, right? Taking once you get a year long capital bike share membership for $95 a year, you had unlimited 45 minute trips on a traditional bicycle. And so the pricing, I think, makes people very sensitive. Um, for example, in DC, we had um, free unlimited rides for those at 200% or less of the federal poverty level, which is about $24,000 a year. Um, and so the usage for that group was incredibly high. So the demand for those for the trips was incredibly high if there's no price sensitivity is my my draw from that. I did not get that from a researcher, so it's not properly vetted. Um, but that's kind of my understanding is that if in a in a completely price insensitive world, people are willing to take as many scooter trips as they can. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. All right. I think it's just about uh, time to wrap up. I want to once again thank my uh, my panelists for your participation, for volunteering, for those excellent presentations and uh, the panel discussion. Um, if you have uh, any additional questions on the forthcoming products on, on shared mobility, my contact information is here and I've also posted it in the uh, chat box. And then if you have questions on the overall NCHRP project, on the other products coming out or the overall product, uh, please uh, contact Kelly and her contact information is on this slide and uh, also in the chat box. Michael's posted additional information just now in the chat box uh, as well on answering on that previous question about publications such as NAPTO on the, the state of micromobility in the country. And then the very last slide. is just uh, a reminder, this is, is the, the second in a series of uh, five webinars uh, from coming out of this project. The next one's coming up in a couple of weeks on uh, five different case studies on the use of smart work zones and the work zone data exchange uh, standard. Um, that's coming up November 30th. Then the Linker AT data tool for integrating uh, different GIS uh, map systems on roadway networks and freight data management is wrapping up that on December 12th. Uh, and the information is there on the web for anyone to, uh, to register for any and all of these. So I thank everyone for your participation, your attendance, uh, and I hope everyone uh, learned something today. Thank you everyone, Thanks, everyone for attending today's webinar. And I also want to thank our panelists. We had a great discussion here today. As I mentioned in the beginning, a recorded version of this webinar will be available on NOCO website. On behalf of NOCO and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thanks.